Alright, greetings friends. Today it is my greatest privilege to have a very special guest right here in our recording studio. Dr. Alex Golovenko is both a Seventh-day Adventist pastor and an experienced lecturer in biblical studies. God has used him to present seminars on SDA history and theology. Alex, greetings. Good to see you, my friend. It's good to be here, Marion. As always. <laughs> So the first question I have for you, when will Jesus come again? And recently, there has been a considerable rise in speculation, not just over the nearness of Christ's return, but with some specific dates associated with it. And in particular, the year 2027. So is this something we can test against the Bible? My answer would be from different perspectives. First, I want to quote the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus says this, of that day and hour, no one knows. And I don't know what it would take for us to get that simple passage, that literally no one knows. It's Matthew 24, verse 36. Jesus but is so adamant about it, not even angels of heaven, but my Father only. And so how could we speculate on something that has not been clearly revealed? Now, our name, Seventh-day Adventist, testifies that we're waiting for Jesus to come. Advent is second coming of Jesus. So we're waiting. But in the past 180 years, we have learned not to set dates. This whole date setting business needs to just disappear, literally. Because if you look in our history, we're setting the first date 30 years from 1844. Because of that, this generation shall not come. So the year 1874 was pregnant with many people trying to set the dates. Then when we approached 70th year, not just Adams, but Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, 1914. They said, well, generation is not 30 years, it's 70. Because the Bible says three scores and 10, right? And I would never forget this, Mary. We're both with you there in Alberta, CUC. Now it's Berman University. My wife loved garage shopping. And we used to go and check out all those garage sales. And one day, we're there, and there's a little bookshelf, and it says religion for sale. I felt bad for it, okay? So I looked at it, and it had a lot of Bibles. And I decided to rescue those Bibles. And so as I picked up a number of those Bibles, like dollar or two uh, each, I brought them home. To send them to Ukraine, you know, people need their Bibles even in English. As so I opened, there was a brochure from Alberta's camp meeting in 1964. And their motto that year was, as it was in the days of Noah, 120 years. You know, that's how long Noah preached. So they added 1844, 120, 1964. We've done it time and again. And it's time for us to understand that we need to focus more on are we ready for his coming instead of speculating on a date. Now, another passage comes to my mind is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17. And uh, Pharisees are pressing Jesus there strongly. And he says this to them. When he was asked by Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, exact question you're asking tonight, when? Is Jesus come? He answered to them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. My paraphrase would be stop looking. Okay, stop looking out there. Some people checking every time Pope sneezes. Some people looking at what's happening in Israel. And Jesus' answer is, Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed the kingdom of God is within you. There are too many people who are concerned about dates and are least concerned about what's happening in their own hearts. No, oh, Alex, listen, before you continue, I just wanted to say, uh, what's wrong with this idea of saying, of course, the Bible say, says that no one knows the day or the hour, but what about the year? What's wrong with just saying approximately in you know 2027, we're going to have something significant happening in, in prophetic interpretation. What would you say to people who say, well, the day and the, the, and the hour we understand, even the angels don't know it. But uh, what about the year? The Bible doesn't you say know, anything about the year. I would also say there is a wrong approach 
because every time it fails, more and more people get disappointed. If we talk about great disappointment of 1844, for those who've been date setting, they have 10 or 20 disappointments already. And every time people get disappointed with another date, they're becoming more and more callous to expectation. Uh, why 2027? Why not 2038? And saying this, I'll uh, show this uh, book by Marvin Moore. He passed away. Great uh, fellow. I remember, again, you probably remember too, he came to CUC a few times and spoke there at Lacombe Community Church. This little book he's written called The Delay, uh, Chapter 3, From Adam to Christ. He's doing calculations. And according to his calculations... The 6,000 years will end in year 2038. So my point is, there's so many theories out there, and each one of them is trying to prove that his or their theory is right. So 2027, I've heard 2025. I've heard 2021. Well, this one is past already, right? When yeah. do we going to learn that Christ probably going to wait for us to run out of all the date of all the possible time speculations? Or will we keep inventing the new and new time speculations? But let me read this one quote. I, I'm going to move in a bit different direction. Ellen White said this. It's uh, volume four of Testimonies, page 307. And she says this. Many who have called themselves Adventists have been time setters. Time after time has been set for Christ to come. But repeated failures have been the result. The definite time of our Lord's coming is declared to be beyond the ken of mortals. So we will not know. What we will know, and this is where I don't want to be uh, vague to say we'll never know. What we will know is that when certain prophecies will be fulfilled, then we know for sure the time is near. For example, when you read the book of Revelation, it's very clear that before the millennium, there will be door of probation closed, so to say. There will be plagues poured out. When that is happening, you know you're within that year, Mary. I think we can have a separate study, as many people believe that those plagues are literally happening right now. What right. makes people come up with this date? You know, Marion, you're right. Some people are preaching that plagues are being poured out already. I remember literally 15 or so years ago, I was pastoring in London. And there was a certain young preacher who came to speak to the students, part of that uh, certain GYC movement. And he was preaching that the plague's being poured out. And I'm sitting thinking, so why are we preaching this? If that's the case, then there's no more repentance. You see, certain conditions need to fall in place. But as you're coming to Daniel chapter 12, in that chapter, there are prophetic dates of 1335 and verse 12, and 1290 days, which are addition to the 1260, or times time and half a time, right? And as we look prophetically, we believe that these dates have pointed out to 1798 and 1843 from a very particular date from the year 508 AD when papacy had received military support from Clovis. So again, that's whole another study. We could go in deep details. And these prophecies are one-time use. They're not a multi-layered approach. You see, these time prophecies do not fit into apotelismatic, using the terminology of Desmond Ford. They do not fit in this multiple approach, you see. Now, the 2027 from the video that you shared with me, and I appreciate you sending it to me, um, tells me that you're also browsing and looking at things, came from an interesting source, uh, Brandley Greenlaw. He's featured on David Gates' YouTube channel, and he recently spoke there in church where David Gates holds his membership. 
he's the one who's suggesting 2027 based on Jubilee calculation. He figured out a new approach of calculating the Jubilee sequence of years. Now, when I hear that, I find it funny because if he's working with David Gates and David Gates is suggesting 2031, they better figure out between two of them which year it is, 2027 or 2031, you know. But again, all that is speculation that is unhealthy. Daniel 12 has none to do. In fact, there's a big mistake. Uh, Daniel is using interesting term, at cats, the time of the end. And it's never meant to be a specific point in time. It means a period of time after prophecies are fulfilled. So since 1843, 1844, we have entered into that at cats. The time of the end has begun. Some suggest perhaps the time of the end has begun in 1798 was the captivity of Pope Pius VI. But in any case, we're living in a period of time of the end. It's not pointing out to a specific year or specific point in time. So I found this chart that is traveling the internet, Alex, and uh, I'm looking at it, and those of you who are watching us, you can see it up on your screen, that this 7,000-year uh, theory has an interesting beginning of 3,974 B.C., do you have anything to say about uh, these dates, especially the starting one? Well, it is definitely an interesting chart. Let's talk about the cosmic week, uh, the 6,000 years and the seventh being the millennium later on. But let's look at this chart first. The very central item that I see here is the year 27, right there, you're pointing at it, right? The year 27 AD, yep. that's the year when Christ began his ministry. That's when he was baptized and anointed. And of course, the year 31 is the year when Christ was crucified. Now, how do we know these dates for certain? They're historical records, but there's also another prophetic timetable, which is the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9. And that's part of that vision that starts in chapter 8. But notice those 490 years is not included in this chart at all. So they take the dates of 27 and 31, which is, you know, the end of 69 weeks and the half of the last week, but they're not showing the chart. And I tell you why. What is of interest is the assertion of Daniel 12. Your question was also about those two dates of Daniel 12. Would they be reapplied for future dates? And this is what I find inconsistent. Here's why. Notice they begin in this chart, 1290, in the year 597 B.C. My question is, why 597? Why not 6 or 5? That's the year when Nebuchadnezzar first ransacked the temple and took most vessels from the temple and took the captives. That's the year when Daniel was taken captive to Babylon. The year 597 was the second pillaging of the temple. And it is described in... Um, Second Chronicles here in my Bible, it is at the end of Second Chronicles chapter 36 when you have King Jehoiachin. And so why is that date? Why not 586 when the temple was destroyed? So you see, there's a three significant dates. They're arbitrarily choosing a date simply because it fits into their 27 years paradigm. When we come to the year 692 AD, that's that's another interesting year because here's what's happening in that year. Yes, that original dome started being built in year 685. Some saying, no, 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 it was started to be built in 688. And yes, it was finished in 692. So, so far fits the profile. But the thing is, as soon as it was completed, okay, it stayed for about four centuries, and then it was uh, damaged by the earthquake in 1015, rebuilt in 1022. 
But when you look in history, the Crusades began that same century, and the Christian Crusaders liberated Jerusalem, and that Dome of the Rock was used as a church by Augustinian monks. That whole Temple Mount was under control of Knight Templars. Uh, the mosque was actually their headquarter. And it was not until, I believe, the year was uh, 1187 when Saladin reconquered Jerusalem. So my point is, Marian, there's some fudging of numbers here to fit a certain profile. But this is not even the main objection. The main objection when I look at this chart, to me, was the assertion that taking away the daily and the abomination of desolation has something to do with these dates. And here's why, Mary. I am going to send you a few pictures. I want you to post them as we're doing this um, recording later on. Perhaps you could insert them. Um, Book of Daniel has no chapters in the original scroll. The division into chapters would come much later. Those books were just scroll of Daniel. We're talking early 13th century that at the University of Paris, Archbishop of Canterbury decided to divide the books into chapters, right? So here's where I'm going with this, Marion. In Daniel 12, 11, you have this. From time that the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 years. So you have two things there. The daily is taken away and abomination of desolation is set up. In previous chapter, and I'm going according to the chapters, but mind you, this is one vision that is in separate. But for our easy reference, chapter 11, verse 31 says, Forces shall be mastered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress, and they shall take away the daily and place the abomination of desolation. Do you see that? It's a repeat. It is one and the same event. And this event is future from perspective of Daniel, who is seeing this vision. And he's recording this vision. Chapter 11 begins in the first year of Darius. So for Daniel, this daily taking away has to do with little horn. Abomination of desolation has to do with little horn. And so you cannot now put this back into 597 BC. You see my point? So this chart is inconsistent with biblical prophecies. And if you dismantle the biblical prophecies of 1260 days or years, 1290 days and years in 1335, you're dismantling the whole chart, including 70 weeks, including 2300 days. And so while they're trying to pinpoint the end of the 6,000 years theory, they are trying to dismantle the prophecies of Daniel as they are interconnected. Because going even back, Marian, chapter 8 of Daniel, I'm looking at verse 12. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily, right? And then uh, 13, when he's asking question, how long will the vision be concerning the daily? So this hatamid, the daily, is very important in understanding the whole dating uh, scheme here, you see. And so there in uh, verse 13, before 2300 days, uh, he's got the transgression of desolation. You see, when sanctuary would be trampled under the foot. So I know I'm using a lot of big words. Bottom line is, it's a consistent vision of Daniel. Chapter 8 is followed by chapter 9, is followed by chapter 11 and 12. And this daily and abomination of desolation are all pointing out to particular future event from Daniel's perspective. No right. way mm -hmm. that taking away of the daily is 597 B.C. You see, so, so I've so, shown you two perspectives already. So, Alex, you, you know, can you explain to our viewers what is the abomination of desolation? 
what is uh, when we use this term and when the the of course the the book of daniel uses this term and jesus used that term right so That's what right. what does it really mean what's the abomination of desolation uh, well, that's another complicated question because notice when Jesus told them that when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by prophet Daniel, then run. And uh, that is something that could be applied a few times because in a future perspective from disciples in uh, 70 AD, when they saw Romans um, walk into the temple, and install their Roman symbols, um, the Christians understood that as a sign for them to flee Jerusalem. According to this chart that is circulating around the internet, the abomination of desolation occurs 1290 years after the Dome of the Rock was built on the temple grounds. So this is what they're using in 692. Well, they want to suggest that the Dome of the Rock is the abomination of desolation, right? So technically, yes, they're involving, you can say, Islam into the abomination of desolation and even suggesting that, you know, they are pagan. And... That is misreading verse 11, Marian, because see, verse 11 says, from the time that daily is taken away and the abomination is set up, there will be 1,290. Blessed is he who waits and come to 1,000. 335 so uh, the the grammatic reading of this verse puts both daily taken away and abomination desolation set up into the same event and so i'm i'm pointing out to this you know daniel 12 daniel 11 and daniel 8 so these are all pointing out to the same event and there's a reason why we as seventh day adventists are looking that in the year 508 when Clovis gave the army to the Pope, if we're consistent that Lil Horn is the Pope, then this abomination of desolation and daily being taken away is pointing out to when the church basically refocused on the ministry of high priest from Christ being priest in heavenly sanctuary to the uh, priest on earth uh, being that role. See, the whole idea, Marion, about uh, the Cosmic Week, I want to take in a different direction. Last summer, I traveled with my boys, and we came to University of Wyoming, which is in Laramie. And we went to see around the campus. And as we walk around, I saw something very interesting. I saw the date posted there, and it was 5,886. And beside it had the letter A-L. And I've never seen it before. I've seen A-M, Anio Mundi, the year from creation of the world. But here is A-L. And then I look above and I could send you the pictures. It had the year 1886, 1886. But on a cornerstone, it said 5886. So I quickly Googled and I've learned that it is the Masonic calculation. The idea of 6,000 years is very big among Masons. Okay? And AL is year of the light. Because they take it back to Genesis story. And God said, let there be light. So Masonic teaching is that God created the earth and created the light 6,000 years ago. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> Amazing. <clears throat> yeah, so... Uh... Masons are using the Bible. And right. uh, are you saying they're doing the same kind of calculation? They have the same uh, beginning year or That's not? Right. That's right. They have very similar calculation focusing on these 6,000 years, the cosmic week. But even bigger shock for any listener should be where it came from. Um, there is agnostic epistle of Barnabas. And in chapter 15, I'm going to read verbatim from verse 4. Observe children, what he finished in six days means. It means this, that in 6,000 years, the Lord will bring everything to an end. For with him, a day signifies a thousand years. So the idea of 6,000 years first originates 
with Gnostic epistle of Barnabas. How's that? Yeah, or this is a, a little bit shocking theory. to be honest with you. <laughs> a little bit shocking, but could it be? Uh, well, truth is truth, no matter where it comes from. You know, some people say. Well, but well is that truth or is that a deception? And this is where this whole idea of six thousand years is unbiblical. You see, uh, there have been different versions of it. For instance, our pioneers were influenced by it too. Ellen White herself was influenced by views of Sylvester Bliss. He was one of the, uh, you know, Millerite movement pioneers. But he um, suggested that 6,000 years should have ended in 1882. And when you look at Ellen White's writings around that year, her statement changed from almost or about 6,000 years to indicate more than 6,000 years, you see. Now, should we make this right now a date-setting matter? You probably heard of Bishop Usher. Um, yeah. He was Anglican bishop, and he calculated chronology to fit history from Adam to Christ into 4,000 years. And so he's the one who suggested a certain date, such as October 22nd, Friday, 4004 B.C., as the date when God created man, Friday, you know. And so you're looking at these theories, and they sound interesting, but they fit only King James Bible narrative. Because when you go to the originals, and this is where we have to be honest to history. When Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 through 49, that was the era when they were uh, picking up pieces of uh, manuscripts there, they realized that Dead Sea Scrolls were confirming Septuagint translation, not the Masoretic version. Because this dating of flood of uh, 1656 from uh, Adam to Noah is only possible through Masoretic reading. But if you go to Septuagint, it actually gives you 2,242 years. And that's why when you look around the world, for instance, you're familiar that according to Jewish calendar, we're still some 200 plus years from the um, 6,000 years, right? Because according hey, to no, I'm sure that a lot of our viewers may be surprised to hear this. And uh, so how is this possible? Because Jewish year right now is 5,784. Okay. So if we go by Jewish calendar, then we still have what? 216 more years to go. So Alex, just wait. So so you're saying that obviously the, the 2027, you know, prophetic interpretation is using the method of calculation that is outside of the Jewish, uh, even tradition? Correct. Outside of the Bible. It's fudging the numbers. There's no other way to put it. Okay. Now, look at Byzantine calendar, uh, which is uh, standard for the Orthodox Church, Greek, Russian, Ukrainian, whatever Orthodox Church. For them, today is the year 7,533. So we're already 1,500 years past the 6,000, according to uh, the, the Greek translations and so on. And, and the confusion is here, Marian. This is where, again, people sometimes don't want to pay attention to the history. Because early Christians expected that the six millennia would end around year 500 A.D., and we have tons of witness from the 4th and 5th century church fathers or Christian writers because they were basing their calculations on Septuagint and on older versions of Hebrew Bible. But when it did not happen, okay, there was tweaking of the numbers. Masoretic version of chronologies of Genesis um, is not corresponding to what was there in the earliest manuscripts. 
They when you say to... when you say Masoretic, uh, Alex, uh, because some of our viewers may not understand this term, what is Masoretic? Uh, Jews who lived in Europe in European diaspora, they developed a system of adding dots and dashes and little, you know, signs to indicate vowels for reading their consonants. Okay, and so that Mazora that simple is called Masoretic style but this is a specific sect of Jews living in Europe and they expected Messiah to come um, 500 AD when it did not happen they had to redo their numbers to push the date by another thousand years you see and it's that translation that would impact later on the English King James and other translations you see so uh, back back to this notice right now if you go to Israel nobody's using those dots and they're, they're simply reading straight consonants because that is not needed right but my point is Marion it's it's so complicated that this 6,000 years theory is unbiblical this is our different people who are trying to to figure out the date by assuming the 6,007th the millennium. There's no biblical ground for it. As I shared with you, Epistle of Barnabas, Masonic teaching, some other earlier ideas, but there is no biblical um, reason for that. And as I mentioned before, David Gates, he decided year is 31. Why? Because Christ was crucified. So arbitrary, he suggested that, well, from creation, Adam and Eve lived 31 years before the sin occurred in the garden. Therefore, we take the year 31. Uh, this particular chart you show with me assumes that 27 years from creation, the evil uh, entered. You know, these are assumptions. Okay. So when you're asking why this particular year BC, well, again, this is fudging the numbers. Another thing that always shocked me, you've been to Egypt, you've seen the pyramids. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, beautiful. If we accept this, then you're trying to squeeze between the flood and Abraham entering Egypt. What, nine dynasties of recorded pharaohs, not nine pharaohs, nine dynasties have come and gone Pyramids are built, and that's all in the span of 200 years. You see, um, if you tell this to our friend Zach Sayed, he, he would love us all in the face. Because this 6,000 years theory is a fiction. This cosmic weak theory is a fiction. So, Alex, so, so what year is it now, according to the Bible, then? I don't know. And I don't want to speculate, okay? When Christ arrives, I'll ask him. I but what about these biblical to... charts? You know, biblical charts. I know that I have one at home that where they try to go back, you know, um, as the Bible describes, you know, uh, how many years each person's lived and, right, right. and approximately, right? Uh, do we have at least approximate knowledge of what year this is? Or and, should we say the Jewish... And... Uh, interpretation is probably closer to reality or uh, no not at all because jews basically had this tendency if the year was not in their favor they throw it out of the calendar as it don't exist that's why they're right now in 5784 okay but here's a simple illustration that i use when you read masoretic based translations that emerged in Europe, and you compare them with Septuagint, there was a long debate, could you trust Septuagint? When Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they affirmed Septuagint. Okay, can, scrolls... you, can you please uh, just clarify for, again, our viewers, what is Septuagint? Septuagint is translation of 70, uh, which is a translation of Hebrew canon that was done in the 3rd century B.C., for the diaspora that lived among Greek-speaking uh, population. And so it is a translation of Tanakh, Torah, Nebim, and Ketuvim into 
Greek language, and that's what we call Septuagint. But here's the difference, Marion. In Septuagint, Adam was 230 when he begot Seth. Masoretic says, no, he was 130. Do you see 100 years is removed? And why is that? Septuagint said Seth was 205 when he begot Enosh. The Masoretic said, no, Seth was only 105, another 100 years removed. Enosh, according to Septuagint, was 190 when he begot Canaan. But Masoretic said, no, no, he was only 90. And so when you follow this, the Genesis chronology in Septuagint has extra 100 years to each patriarch, which disappeared in much later Masoretic version. Why? Because when they realized their 6,000 years theory did not work, they removed almost a whole thousand years by removing 100 from these patriarchs and created a, a, a different version of chronology. So once again, we cannot ignore this history, you see. So once again, this 2027 uh, year prophetic chart that is circulating is literally following the Masoretic version of uh, of time counting, right? But the Dead Sea it Scrolls, is. and I think it's an important point. You say that that's over... the Dead Sea Scrolls prove uh, and support the Septuagint Correct. Right, version Correct. of counting. Correct. Okay. And not only that, Marion, what uh, surprises me on that chart particularly, that it suggests that there is a, a cosmic week of seven days at the very end to me, that is resembling exactly what the uh, Jesuit Francisco Ribera did. Remember the gap theory? He took the seventh week from Daniel's 70 weeks and he threw it in the future and said, well, there would be Antichrist and pre-trib and mid-trib and post-trib and all that. And so here's an Adventist version that supposedly started with COVID in 2020. So I, I see the chart inspired not by biblical knowledge but by fear of recent covid pandemic i see well you know you're mentioning something interesting so this is pretty much a futuristic uh method of interpretation of mm -hmm. the book of daniel mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was originated as you said by the, by the jesuits correct mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in what year oh it was um mid 16th century so it was uh, around council of trent era and francisco ribera was tasked with countering Martin Luther and reformers who were saying that Pope was the Antichrist. So he created the futuristic explanation to say, no, 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 the Antichrist and all this business is still distant future, the last week, the seven years tribulation, you know. So this is mid-16th century theory. And now I'm seeing Adventist version of it. Yeah, no, this is uh, this is very an eye opener, I'm sure, for people who are watching this. And folks, if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. We'll put the email here on the screen. Uh, but it is surprising, though, that some of us are forgetful of the history mm -hmm. and uh, and forgetful of the methods of interpretation. And this is why majority of evangelical churches today do not follow the Protestant method that was developed, which is historicist method, mm -hmm. that was developed by Martin Luther. And, uh, and of course, uh, you mentioned today that in the 16th century, another method was developed, taking those seven years and putting it in, into the future. So many people are still waiting for that Antichrist to come. They're still waiting for that Antichrist to come because of this uh, futuristic interpretation. And so, so, so these charts... And once again, I'm going to put this chart back on the screen here, is following the futuristic method of interpretation of the book of Daniel, correct? Right. When you look at that last sabbatical seven-year period, that is just outright funny. By the way, here's another inconsistency that I noticed. Notice this, 40 jubilees of 2,000 years. Well, if you do the math, what he's doing, he's multiplying 40 by 50, and you get... 2000 years but when you listen to that video he's actually suggesting that jubilees are not 50 years but 49 where the 50th year becomes the first year of the next jubilee cycle 
And so he's redoing the math to fit 2027 based on 49s. But here on this chart is 50s. So again, what is the Jubilee period? Is it 50 years or 49 years? It's unclear from these presentations, you see. And so again, when I see these inconsistencies and speculations and fudging numbers, I have not just questions. I'm saying, come on, you are being inconsistent with uh, with this uh, method of date setting. Notice that they try to fit the 1260 prophetic days or years into literal three and a half years at the very end. Do you see that at the very end of the chart over there? 1260 days persecution, so three and a half years of persecution. That is right out of that Jesuit Francisco Rivera's playbook of uh, persecution that's supposed to happen when Antichrist uh, comes. But he here's another point, Marion. These charts, sure, they're interesting. But haven't we learned when William Miller... Um, led the movement. There are two fellows, Charles Fitch and Apollos Hale, who in 1840 created also a chart. And that's a significant chart, very important chart. But in that chart, they also have the 2,520 years prophecy, which we do not take seriously at all. It's the one based on Daniel 4, the seven times, you know, uh, but that's included. We cannot deny it. it was in Miller's prophecy. You see, today as we look back, we say, sorry, there's no place for that. Um, Joseph Bates, well-known Joseph Bates. He loved that chart. He actually used that term, you know, write a vision, make it plain on tablets. And he encouraged the use of the chart. And then when expected coming of Christ did not happen in 1844, what did he do? He read Leviticus 16, and he saw priests dipping his finger seven times and dropping the blood in front of the mercy seat. And he said, seven more years. Let's wait until 1851. And therefore emerges the shut door theory for next seven years. You know, if we honest with our own history, we need to realize all these speculations do nothing but just discourage people. You know, what's interesting is that uh, I read in, in the circulation that on the internet, and it says pretty much the following. It says, if the year 2027 is correct, and if it refers to the second advent, then we can expect the final events to start happening very soon. So, uh, so in other words, <laughs> uh, somebody can say, well, Pastor Alex, uh, you know what? Maybe the dates are wrong, but maybe it's good for us as Christians to be living in constant alert. What would you say to people who say that I, I need that? I need that alertness. You know that parable of crying wolf? You cry wolf too many times and there is no wolf. Pretty soon nobody would believe that there is a wolf. Okay. I believe this is method straight from hell, from Satan, trying to actually discourage people. I'll give you another example. This is not new. Um, back uh, in, uh, what, in November 2015, okay, there was a teaching that Pope's visit to United States in September of that same year, right? Remember that? Yeah. That that would trigger something. You know, I remember David Gates was teaching this, and then there's another really popular and famous preacher, Arthur Branner. His wife, Esme, had a special book. She was on 3ABN. She was traveling, camp meetings and all that. And they tried to allegorize the story of Joseph, saying basically in 2001, seven years of plenty began. And then in 2008, remember the depression, the economic collapse? That's when the seven years of, of starvation and, and economic downturn which would come now to 2015. And then Pope came and spoke to the Senate in September of 2015, which started the seven years of last tribulation, you know? Well, this is all past already. Has any of them apologized for the nonsense they're preaching? And for thousands of people 
who liquidated bank accounts and sent their money to them? This is serious, Marion. I'm speaking because as a pastor, I know people who quit their businesses, sold their assets, liquidated, and sent their finances to these certain preachers because they lived in fear that they've got three and a half years. And if that's the case, why worry? You know, let's let's get rid of it. Let's sell it. And what happens after? When they get disappointed, they walk away from church. They walk away from faith. You know? Yeah. My, my dad used to quote this, Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And that's wow, that's happened. a powerful verse, uh, Alex. Well, where is it again? Proverbs 13, 12. When we give people false hopes and those hopes don't come through, it makes heart sick. And that's what's been happening lately with all these date settings. There's a lot of hopes that have been crushed. Like you and I have been in ministry long enough to witness a lot of these date settings and predictions. You see, oh, Pastor, what if, what if people say, "Hey, uh, Alex, uh, we are Seventh Day Adventist. It's part of our name. We should be proclaiming this soon return of the Lord, and we're not doing this anymore. The people are not even preaching the three angels' message." And and uh, what would you say to this criticism? Which sometimes, uh, do you think there is any validity that we are losing? That you can say that fiber. Of, of the soon return of Christ? I would disagree. And here's why. Um, Three Angels' message is not about date setting. We are preaching that the hour of judgment has come. There's no questions. We're living under judgment. But that judgment, again, is often misinterpreted. I'd never forget how Clifford Goldstein shared his first experience was understanding Adventist theory of judgment. He came from Judaism, a secular person, married an Adventist, and asked her, and she tells the story. He's actually written that in, in a book. She says, well, you never know when your file is pulled out. And God forbid you're watching a movie during that time. Your file is put wanted, found wanted, not worthy for heaven. And you don't know that. So you keep coming to church, you keep paying tithes, you keep doing everything right, not knowing that you have no hope because your file's been dismissed. That is such a false picture of judgment because the judgment we preach is God is vindicating his saints. God's grace is transforming his saints that they would be fit and suited for heaven. And only God knows when that time is right. You see, um, I know you're going to be editing, but here's the thing, Marion. Something that nobody's focusing on in all these date setting is the book of Revelation chapter 13 makes it clear that only when the image of the beast is established, then we proceed to the outpouring of plagues. We're not there yet. The image of the beast is yet to come. And so all these speculations, they're irrelevant, okay? They're just waste of time. I see. Very interesting. Well, you know, there is the mark of the beast, and I know this is a big topic. And we know as Protestants, we have identified historically papacy as, as playing a major role and being... The mark of the beast but the image of the beast is also an interesting understanding because the mark of the beast it was interpreted even by martin luther but now in these last days maybe some people are surprised that when we will see the image established in the image of the beast so what do you mean when you say that we already had the mark of the beast we understand he came to change the law persecuted the saints and we know that all all of that happened in the history but what are, what are we still waiting for what is this uh, image of the beast so the mark of the beast is clear but then is the image of the beast what do you mean by that well book of revelation 
has these three different entities. There's beast coming from the sea, which we all agree is a Roman Catholic church. There's no debates about it. But then there's a beast coming from the earth, which we conclude that it is the United States and the religious movements within the U.S. But then it's this beast coming from the earth that influences those living on earth to create the image to the first beast, which is a new entity. It's not a reviving the first beast. It's creating a new entity that would be like that first beast from the sea, but would be a whole new thing. But you put me on the spot. You know, there's an interesting quotation from Great Controversy. I believe it's page 449. And it says this. Let me pull it up here for a second. It is not until the issue is plainly set before people and they're brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of man that those who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. And if you read the whole paragraph, she actually says that it's page 445. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. So if Ellen White was saying that the mark of the beast is yet to be defined, okay, she was challenging us not to speculate until, you see? Very interesting. And in that paragraph says the image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism, which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. Are we there yet? So she understood that something will be happening in the future. Corrupt Protestant church in America will create a new system, and that is yet future. So Marion, between us, when I see these speculations, they're totally missing the point. Okay? And that's why it will come and go, and you and I will live into 2027 past, and they will come up with new ideas. They will be recalculating to create 2038 as the next date, and so on. And I wonder if we would ever learn. You know, Alex, I wonder if we should uh, contact some of the, these pastors that promote these ideas and engage them in a, in a discussion. You can say a panel discussion, and I know that, unfortunately, many years ago, if you remember, we tried to reach out to at least one very popular speaker and challenge him on a few things that he mentioned, and he would never accept our invitation or invitation of even the conference, because often these are independent ministries that are doing these things. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if we can uh, maybe invite and see if they will respond to our invitation to be engaged in a discussion regarding these dates of 2027 and using a, a method that is not supported as we believe that at right. the end of today's I've study. I've seen the opposite. I've seen these people set the dates, and when the dates don't come through, they say, we'll be praying that God would delay, you know? And I find this is such a cop-out, okay? But on, on the delay idea, there's another thought that comes to my mind, Marian, because um, it's did you notice that in parables of Jesus, it's the wicked servant, evil servant, who says in his heart, my Lord delays. Matthew 24, 48. It's the evil servant that says in his heart, my Lord delays. We should never say that Jesus is delaying because he never given us a certain date. He is on his time. Just because we don't know when he's coming, we should not say, my Lord is delaying his coming, you see. You know, Alex, I wonder if we should have another recording and really discuss about this interesting, uh, perhaps shocking uh, revelation for maybe some of the viewers, especially Adventists who who probably just discovers the discover this great controversy quote that you mentioned, that we are still to to identify the mark of the beast. Of course, this is not to discredit all of our interpretation from uh, the past, but obviously we we can explore the subject even more. But when it comes to date setting and interpretation of our historicist approach to of Daniel chapter eleven and twelve, 
we can conclude today that these calculations are not supported by the Bible. Correct. They actually come from very questionable sources, mm -hmm. including uh, Masonic secret societies. And uh, would it be correct to say that, yeah, I'm afraid what I'm going to say, but because in many ways, some of the pastors that promoted this idea have also done a lot of work, a lot of good work in our church. But we do have in our history also people who have, despite of all the good things, of all the good, thing, good things that they have done, they have developed very unhealthy theologies that are not in sync with the united body of Christ. And, and as Adventists... Mary, we have yeah. plenty of history for that. E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones did a great thing in 1888, Righteousness by Faith. Where did they end up? Apostatized from the church. Do you see my point? Dr. Yeah. Kellogg did great things. Where did he end up? Not only apostatized from the church, he became part of eugenics movement, fighting for racial purity of white supremacy. So when people in their pride um, lack humility, and, and begin to assert some teachings that they're righter than everybody else, instead of submitting themselves to, to the church at large, to the revelations of God. Because I know this, when God reveals to his prophets, he doesn't reveal to one. He confirms through the body. And that's important to remember. Oh, thank you, Alex. Well, you know what? I, I, I believe that just one of the last and final questions following this chart, it says the fact that the same year 2027 mm -hmm. can be established based on not one, but three separate sources, the Jubilee and sabbatical years, Daniel 12, 11 to 12, spirit of prophecy, should finally awaken us mm -hmm. and make us very happy. And so kind of troubles me to hear this are we really in trouble as a church are we really dead that we always have to be awake is our church asleep do we have a problem right now worldwide that our church is sleeping and it says and will make us very happy are we unhappy as seventh-day adventist in 2024 well, that Are we unhappy just... to live our daily lives we always need to be thinking of the second coming do we you have know, a problem that we need to wake up? Are we dead? And do we... I would say second coming should always be in our mind because that is the blessed hope. I literally wish Jesus would come even right now. Tomorrow, for that matter. You know, come soon, Lord Jesus. But this awakening is a false sound. It's not sounding the, the gospel trumpet because pulling out some jubilee and and these feasts and, and uh, years. Uh, let me read you another quotation from Spirit of Prophecy, okay? She says, if you have become estranged and have failed to be Bible Christians, be converted. The character you bear in probationary time will be the character you will have at the coming of Christ. If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. So for some of these people, stop doing math and maybe check your character to see if you're a loving and lovable Christian in your community, in your family, and with people they interact. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. That's a powerful quote. Because in my opinion, in my humble opinion, we should be more concerned about our practical Christianity, about being more loving and lovable. Because our churches today are not dead, nor asleep, but what we lack is the love of Christ. When character of Christ is represented in us, that is more of my concern than figuring out some dates based on dubious calculations. All right. Well, Pastor Alex, thank you so much for your presence here. 
I hope we can uh, record uh, other programs with you, and we will, by God's grace. So, folks, thank you for being here with us. Please leave your comments, subscribe to our channel, and like the video, because we want to spread this good news of uh, living a satisfied Christian life and be prepared to live in these final days. And Jesus is coming soon, yet we do not know the day or the hour. God bless you. And Pastor, maybe we should pray at the end. Yes. And, uh, and I think I have a prayer request, is to ask that God will bless Christians around the world in all denominations, and especially as pastors of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, I pray that we will find in among our members common sense, right? And faithfulness to that Protestant interpretation of Scripture, which is based on historicist view, and avoid the extremes of interpretations that are not coming from the right source. And I think that is my personal prayer request. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thankful for your love, for your mercy and grace. Lord God, you've promised that you will come to take us home, that you will bring an end to this troubled world. And Lord God, we wait for that time. But until then, we enjoy living in your presence, seeking your face daily. And I pray that you would give clarity, open the eyes to believers around the world, that they would be your hands and your feet, that your loving presence would be evident wherever your believers are. Amen.